Ngalecki. Let's get to it. Previous videos have provided the lengthy buildup to the sequential circuit design work we'll begin here. Recall that in a design, we start with a goal and then build up to accomplish that goal. I will warn you that this first design is often overwhelming for students, but you will get plenty of practice following similar procedures over the next couple weeks. And you will soon look back fondly at the simple vending machine. Be sure to print out and work through the follow along worksheets to help ease the learning curve. Here we have our design algorithm. You will have this memorized by heart before too long. Just these five steps allows us to build a wide variety of sequential circuits. The first step is to draw a state diagram, which graphically represents the circuit's operation. An example is shown in the top right. The second step is to choose a flip-flop type, D, T, or J, K, and make the corresponding transition table. The third step is to make a next state table. This is usually the most time-consuming portion of a design, as you will fill in many rows and columns of ones and zeros, and try not to let your eyes go blurry. The fourth step is to use that next state table to derive Boolean equations for flip-flop inputs. With our relatively small circuits, this will be done with Carnot maps. Finally, step five is to apply those equations and build a circuit, either physically or in a simulator. Of course, that build should then be tested. Here is our first task. Design a gumball machine controller, following a Mealy model, that will send the signal to drop a gumball once four cents has been deposited. All real-world problems need follow-up questions, and even this basic academic problem needs some. What questions would you ask? Here are four important questions that I would ask. Can the user choose the gumball color? What coins will be accepted? Can the user request change? Can more than one coin be deposited at once? The assumptions we'll make with this design are provided here. No, the gumball color will be random. Our controller design will simply send the signal to open the gumball chute. Only pennies will be accepted. No, the user cannot request money back. They better be sure they want a gumball before they start putting money in. And only one coin can be deposited at any one time. So there will just be a slot for one penny. And if we use a high enough clock frequency, it won't be physically possible for a human to pass in two pennies quickly enough. Even with a relatively slow clock frequency of one kilohertz, a user would have to push in two pennies in less than one thousandth of a second. With this problem statement, and with your understanding of state diagrams from our previous sequential circuit lessons, try to draw a state diagram for this design. Pause the video while you do. Here are the steps for drawing the state diagram. First, we draw one node for each possible memory state. In this problem, that means a node to represent 0 cents, 1 cent, 2 cents, and 3 cents. Why not 4 cents? Because that is the cost of the gumball. The moment that 4 cents are deposited, the gumball chute opens, and the memory should return to 0 cents. So, there isn't a memory state of 4 cents. The state names A, B, C, and D are arbitrary and not entirely necessary. But I find them convenient because if I'm talking only about cent numbers and binary numbers, it is easy to get those mixed up. By involving letters, it helps my brain keep organized. What is necessary is the binary code for each state. The flip-flops will be operating on the binary numbers we include in these nodes. In truth, the order doesn't matter. I could go 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0 if I wanted but I don't want to do that. I'd much rather just use a straight binary count to keep things simple. With the nodes in place, we now draw arrows. For this problem, there will be two arrows leaving each node. The first set of arrows are the cases when a penny is added. If the machine has two cents and a penny is added, then it should update to 
three cents. If the machine has three cents and a penny is added, then it should update to zero cents to start the next purchase. The second set of arrows are the cases when no penny is added. These are simple. They all loop back to the same node because if no money is added, the total money should not change. The last thing to do, and the thing I forget most often, is to indicate any special output cases. In this design, the special output will be the signal that tells the gumball chute to open. This will only happen after a penny is added to a state of three cents. So I place a star next to that particular arrow. The state diagram is now complete. Step two of our design process is the simplest. Choose a flip-flop type. We could choose any of these options. This time, let's go with JK flip-flops. So this top transition table is the one we'll use. Step three is to make the next state table. This contains a lot of information. So let's go through it piece by piece. First, there are three broad sections, present state, next state, and required flip-flop inputs. This should look familiar to our analysis tables from last week, with the big difference being that the two right sections are switched. Under the state sections, there is a column called name, which will hold the state names A, B, C, D from our state diagram. Next to that, two flip-flops are listed, Q1 and Q0. Why two? Because our state diagram used two-bit codes. There is also an X column, which represents the input signal or whether or not a penny was deposited. This table layout includes each state name twice, once for X equals zero and once for X equal one. In total, this gives our table eight rows. That is good news because our state diagram had eight rows. Each row of the table should correspond with one arrow of the diagram. For example, this top row shows what happens when leaving state A with an input of zero. Our diagram tells us this should return to A. So we write A in this cell. The next row shows what happens when leaving state A with an input of one. Our diagram tells us this should go to B. So we write in B in this cell. We continue this process down for all of the rows, as you see here. Also notice I filled in the Z column. This is the output signal, or whether or not the gumball chute should open. Our state diagram only has a star next to the one leaving state D, so that is the only cell with a high value. These Q1 and Q0 columns are easy to fill in. Simply match each state name with its binary code. For example, here is an A, which is binary code 00. Here is a C, which is binary code 10. With this start, try to complete the rest of the table. For this rightmost section, you will need to apply the JK transition table. Pause the video. Here, I filled in the present and next state sections. Compare your results to these. Identify any mistakes you may have made and try to understand why. Most people make lots of mistakes at first. Now let's focus on the J and K columns. Here we need to match the subscripts. So for J1 and K1, ignore all the other columns except Q1 present and Q1 next. Then apply the transition table. In the top row, zero jumps to zero. The transition table tells us that j equals zero and k equals x, so we filled those in here. Conceptually, this means that the flip-flop could be either in no change or reset mode. The next couple rows are actually the same transition, so you could fill those in easily. Let's look at this change from state b to c. Here, q1 jumps from zero to one. Therefore, j1 equals one and k1 equals x. I'll show the full table in just a second. If you want time to try the rest yourself, pause the video now. And here we have the completed table. Again, be sure to compare your results with these before moving on. Now we can perform step four, 
derive the Boolean equations for all the flip-flop inputs as well as the output z. Always remember that the inputs to these equations come from the present state columns. The Carnot maps for J1 and K1 are given here. We see many x's, which is good for two reasons. It matches what we found in the next state table, and it makes for simple final equations. Try your hand at deriving the equations for J0, K0, and Z. Pause the video while you do. Here are the simplest equations. J0 equals x, K0 equals x, and Z equals Q1, Q0, x. For this particular design, it so happens that J0 and K0 share the same equation. Also, J1 and K1 share the same equation. That's just a coincidence. Don't expect that in the future. This slide is a recap of design steps one through four. I hope you find it useful to see all the pieces on one screen. The state diagram and the transition table are separate starting pieces. They combine together to form the next state table. That table directly leads us to the Boolean equations. And the equations take us to the final circuit. Here is the final circuit, almost. I left off a couple supporting components for now, so we can focus on what our design told us. First, we have two flip-flops. That's because we had two bits in our state codes. These flip-flops are connected to a common clock. Our equations determine how the flip-flop instructions are wired. J0 equals x. Therefore, the x input switch feeds directly into the J0 port. The same is true for K0. J1 equals Q0 and x. So we see an AND gate. One input to it is x. The other input is the Q output from flip-flop 0. The AND gate feeds straight into the J1 port, and also K1 in this case. Finally, the output signal z is created by this AND gate. Because this video has gone on long enough, I will stop right here. I'll make another video which shows this completed circuit with all the other supporting components in operation in the simulator.